All right, well, we've got things to figure out here as we get a little bit closer. It's still it's just cutting out right now. Running some interference here in the football field. Um, good morning here on a beautiful day in Rootstown, Ohio, after a mustery Sunday. Welcome to Fairhaven Church of Rootstown on a beautiful Sunday. I'm going to just kind of blow through these uh, announcements, not a whole lot of new news. Um, this afternoon, the youth group will meet at uh, the girls' house at 4 o'clock, and they're going to set up shop at 4.30, thank you, uh, for the Easter egg hunt, uh, which is also coming up. Um, when is that? It's April 2nd. Uh, so stay tuned for that. March 26th, The Chosen. Uh, that's tonight. It's the finale over at the McIntyre's house. So uh, come one, come all. Uh, great crowd there. Season finale for the episode two uh, Bible study. April 7th. Um, reminder on a Good Friday this year, we're going to actually do it at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. on Good Friday right here at Fairhaven. And um, look at the uh, briefing we're, we're reaching out for a couple of things um, for those of you that have been bringing in the uh, mac and cheese this month for the Ravens packs. That's going on and happening now. Thank you for that. And then the adult outreach um, is still collecting some toiletry uh, items for um, blessing bags to be dispersed. Easter candy, if you, if you have it still, uh, we'll have to, we're happy to take that. I keep cutting out, and it's kind of weird. But, um, and then BBS is a big one. BBS is coming up uh, June, July, what are we, 15th? July 15th. So sign up. Up there, I saw about 20 uh, folks signed up. Only 10, I think. One, one for each eye. Yeah. Okay, so, but still could use many more for that, and that's a huge uh, push this year. Um, that's kind of the quick down and dirty on the announcements. Um, as we turn to prayer and praise, um, we want to, good news is for Rick Legg's mom, uh, recovering after surgery there. She's going to be in the um, kind of uh, post-care, I guess, for about seven to ten days or so. Um, another big one is for Eric Corwin. Please keep him and his family in your prayers. And of course, J.D. Langland as well, both for um, some cancer uh, stuff happening in their lives. And, and so please keep them in prayer. Um, I just want to point out that I'm so glad to see the uh, folks back that have been, been out. So it's great to hear that you're progressing as well and, and your grandpa as well. So very cool. Uh, any other praise moments that you want to share? Anyone out there? We had a great turnout at the first time sports event. Anybody that was there, I don't know if there's anything to do with Very cool. Boosters. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good turnout from Fairhaven. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Um, okay, well then, um, bear with the audio. We're, we're trying to figure it all out. So there's a lot of buttons back here to push and a lot of things to pair up to make sure they match. And so um, we all go through that. And then I'm being asked about, I haven't done announcements for a month or so. I was asking myself, prayer requests. If anyone has any prayer requests from the congregation, we'll take those, please. Okay. Well, then we'll turn it over to open up worship.
Father, with all of the, the hiccups and twists and turns that you give us in this life, we are thankful to be gathered here this morning as brothers and sisters in the faith, gathered in your house, Lord, to give you glory and honor for the good and for the bad. And Lord, we just humbly ask you to forgive us of our sins, that we may stand present, that we may stand present before you, spotless because of the blood of Jesus. Lord, we are chosen by you. We are who we are because of who you say we are. Let us never forget that, Lord. Lord, we lift up to you all of the folks that we're praying for. We continue to pray for Eric and for JD, Lord. Keep them close to you and keep them in the palm of your hands. We pray for Tracy's sister Jody and her ongoing battles, that you would lift them up. We continue to pray for Rick's mom. We're thankful that she had a good surgery. We continue to pray for her recovery and for all of uh, Rick's family. Lord, we lift up to you all of the other folks that we're playing, praying for. We lift up to you the unspoken requests within our hearts. For Lord, you tell us to cast our anxieties upon you. You tell us to cast our cares upon you, that you will bear those for us. And just leave us with your peace. We love you, Lord. We pray for our church. We pray for our congregation and we pray for our community. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to strengthen our resolve to give us the desire to live your mission of sharing the gospel with a world that needs it, of growing us, Lord, that we may know you more day by day, that we may become conformed to your image more day by day. Lord, we're thankful for the gifts that we receive today, that they're given with cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things return to you. We love you, Lord. We ask for this in your name. Amen. Oh, 
with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Now, having, having established all of that, now we understand what is our purpose here. 
What is your purpose here? Because every single person that's sitting in this room right now has a purpose. Every single person that's sitting in this room right now is a priest in the kingdom. What does that mean? We're going to get into that too. What is your purpose and why are you here? Because every single one of us is here for a reason and every single one of us is here for a purpose. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So if you've got your Bibles open, follow with me. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 10, but we're really going to deep dive on verse 9 for the message. Rid yourselves therefore of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe he is precious, but for those who do not believe, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Fill our hearts that we may be tender to the leading of your word. Fill our ears and our minds that we may be attentive to your word so that we may learn your word, we may love your word, and we may live your word. We ask for this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. It's actually, uh, it's actually, uh, I think, destined by God, and and really awesome that um, the that Lori's in Pennsylvania because I get to have the youth group in here today, and I really want you all, in particular, to pay attention to this message because I talk a lot about kind of some feelings that you all may have. Right? It goes for the adults, too. It's also kind of cool. We got to have uh, Lexi and uh, our latest sing with Charlotte today, which is always awesome, because uh, Lucy and, and Sally are gone. Why are you here? Who are you? And why are you here? You know, when I was growing up, in some respects, I felt like I didn't fit in. I always felt, in a way, down deep, like I didn't fit in. In some odd, undefined way, that I couldn't totally understand. I felt like I didn't belong, like I was in the wrong place. I've actually been called the black sheep of my family, which is really hilarious if you understand what a black sheep is usually like, that I'm the black sheep. My family was Italian, is Italian, very Italian, extremely Italian, Sicilian to be precise. I grew up in a home where we didn't speak English. The only time my mom spoke English to us is when she was mad. When she called me Vincent instead of Vincenzo, I knew that I had done something wrong. And we were so secluded in our little immigrant community, I did not know what peanut butter was until I was 10 years old. And in fact, I still remember when I discovered what stuffing was. Like me and my brothers would watch commercials for stuffed kind of stuffing, and we would say to each other, what on earth are they eating? Like we just, we didn't understand what that meant. And then I went to Lori's when I was 21, and we were eating, for Thanksgiving, and I looked at this plate of stuff. I said, what is this? And she goes, that's stuffing. And I remember I called my brother up, like, dude, I know what stuffing is now, it's bread, <laughs> right? No clue, we didn't have any of those things. We were Italian, we were proud of it. My dad worked two jobs. He was a college professor at Kent State for a while, then he went to Akron, he where he was a dean for a while. He also ran the restaurant with my grandparents. My mom stayed at home with all five of us. When I was little, we were on North Hill, but when we moved to Town Hitch, and literally my entire neighborhood from North Hill moved to Town Hitch. Every neighbor that I had in Town Hitch was our neighbors 
from North Hill. It's like someone went through and sold everybody a lot on that block, right? I went to St. Anthony's and I went to Hoban, and even though some people think, boy, you went to private school, our, our, our family back then was tight with money. We, we didn't have a lot of money. I remember buying my clothes at Zares and Gold Circle. Those are some blasts from the past, if you think about it. And I remember when Payless Shoes first came out, we thought we hit the jackpot because of Payless Shoes. We got two shoes for the price, two pairs of shoes for the price of one, right? And when my dad went there, I wanted Air Jordans. And my dad said, man, they got them at Payless. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me these shoes that look like Air Jordans, but they were actually Coliseums. <laughs> and I'm like, dad, those are Coliseums. He's like, Coliseums are better, you dummy. You got two of them. <laughs> They're not, but OK. <laughs> but we didn't lack for anything. We always had plenty to eat and plenty to do. It's not like we felt inferior in any way. My grandparents, who I was always with, they instilled a, a huge sense of brightness, right? And even though they didn't care too much about how good we were as athletes, and academics was always a big thing in our family. So as I got older, I tried to overcompensate by being a, a, a better student, right? By working harder that way, I worked hard at the restaurants and just kind of like prove somehow that I fit in. And honestly, that hard work had never translated to any sport team that I ever played on because I was a coach's nightmare, okay? I'm just telling you, as long as I got to wear a jersey, I didn't care what I did on the team, right? I didn't try too hard. From the outside, most people I went to high school, I don't think would have ever guessed that I, that I felt this way or that I was trying to, to fit in. I was present in my class, I was popular, I was an honor student, all that stuff. But somehow, I still knew that I was different than everybody else that I was around. When I got to college, this proving myself really kicked into high gear. I went to Kent State, right? Where I met Lori. But as all of you know, Kent State, just like it is today, was an incredibly progressive and liberal school 20 years ago, just like it is today. Not, not much has changed. And I was on campus, and it's hard to believe this too, just 20 years after the shootings had happened, right? So, so that was still talked about. In fact, I was on campus, there was less time between when I was on campus and the shootings than there is from today to 9-11. So think about that, right? And I was on campus. And I knew as I walked around campus that I did not fit in with most of the people that I was going to school with. But I worked hard. I worked two jobs the whole way through school. I finished at Kent State in seven years with three degrees and all sorts of, of academic honors and stuff. And I'm not, this is not a show-off thing. I'm just, I'm going somewhere with this. That feeling carried into the ministry too. I've been tremendously blessed by God that every place that God has placed me has been successful. I went to Malone. I got my master's degree there. I literally poured myself into every project. And I did more than I had to. If it was an eight to 10 page paper, I would turn in a 20 page paper. If it was a 20 page paper, I would turn in a 50 page paper. That has carried on into, into Liberty and Seminary now. But it wasn't until recently that I really started to think about the fact, maybe over the last eight to 10 years, that sometimes this drive to succeed and sometimes this drive to prove who I was could unintentionally hurt people, especially the people that were closest to me. I started to see that my need to succeed sometimes could hurt Lori, sometimes could hurt the kids, because it took me away from them, took the tension away from them. They were incredibly supportive. They always have been. But I've never known a time where I haven't been working two jobs. I, I, I've barely known a time when I haven't been in school. And if you ask my family, I don't have downtime. Because in my downtime, I'm reading or I'm writing or I'm meeting with somebody. To make it even worse for Lori, when I came to the faith and I went to school, then all of a sudden, I became an expert on the topic, and I kept telling Lori all of these things that she believed were wrong. And then we would fight. 
And she would say to me, great, you've been a Christian for five minutes and now you know everything, right? And then one day it dawned on me, thinking over my behavior. And this is where I want everyone to think about it because I think many, if not all of you, will relate. I realized that I had to face the fact that sometimes my motivations are an awful lot about me. Right? Sometimes my motivations are about me. And I know I'm not alone in thinking this. Think about it for yourself personally. Have you ever slowed down the pace of your life? And I do mean slow down the pace of your life. Because don't go on it everybody I talk to doesn't tell me how busy they are all the time. Right? All the time they're busy. But have you ever slowed down the pace of your life to think deeply about what you're doing and why you're doing it. What you're doing and why you're doing it. And what is the motivation behind what you're doing? Can you admit that maybe an awful lot of it is about you? Maybe an awful lot of it is about you. Brothers and sisters, we, as men and women, and as people, we thirst for recognition. We pine for success. We love power and position. The reality is we want the ball. We want the ball all the time. We live for the next project. We thirst for the applause that winning gives us. Right? I know that an awful lot of us live by the adage of Ricky Bobby's dad. Right? Right? All right, is first place or what? Last. First place or last, that's it. Our flesh in its full sinfulness craves this and wants this. That's why what we read in verse 9 is the antidote. Verse 9 of what we read, that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Sometimes we talk about what it's going to take for us to have a biblical worldview. And a worldview has answers for questions like, who am I? And how did I get here? And why am I here? And where am I heading? Rick Warren, several years ago, wrote the book, or many years ago now, wrote The Purpose Driven Life because of how many people were asking him these questions. And it's not very often that you can find crystal clear answer to those questions. But for today, in what we read, I think you can find crystal clear answers to at least two of those questions. And the two questions that we're going to answer through Scripture today is who am I and why am I here? Who am I and why am I here? Let's start with who am I? How do you view yourself? You need to ask yourself that, honestly. How do you view yourself? That's an important question. That's an important question. Brothers and sisters, if you don't answer this question biblically, the reality is you will be perpetually unhappy. You will be perpe perpetually discontent. You'll drink too much, you'll eat too much, you'll work too hard, you'll spend too much, you'll try to please people too much, you will obsess about everything because you just won't be happy with who you are. We see that real easy with social media, right? How many people are out there that what you see online and what you see in real life are not the same thing? I, I use the illustration all the time, and I hope you aren't sick, but it's such a great illustration. In Pirates of the Caribbean, there is a great scene where Captain Barbosa and Jack Sparrow, they're both going for the seven pieces of nine, I think it was called, or the eight, seven pieces of eight. I don't remember. Lori always corrects me, and she's not here. But they're both going for it, and they're standing by this light, right, that's shining down through the ceiling. And Captain Barbosa looks at Jack Sparrow, and he goes, you don't know what it's like to eat and eat and drink and drink and never be satisfied. And then he moves into this light 
And this light reveals that he's actually dead. And he's a skeleton. So everything that he's eating and everything that he's drinking is just falling right out of him as soon as he eats it. So there's no satisfaction there. So he's always needing more. Brothers and sisters, when, when we're answering who we are and why we're here without God, that's what we become. That's what we become. Why do you think you see all of these celebrities and athletes that spend and spend and buy and buy and still aren't happy? Because that something's missing. They don't know who they are. Lori always laughs when, when we would go to like family reunions on my side. Lori will always say, you are not related to this family. Because my brothers, my sister, my parents, everything that they wear is either Gucci or Dolce Gabbana or Bruno Maggi. All of their cars, every two years, a new Beamer, new whatever, they, they douse themselves with super expensive cologne. And then I show up with my slippers on, my mismatched socks. <laughs> Whatever cologne I get on sale on Amazon, right? <laughs> but when you find who you are in Christ, you realize that you can be yourself everywhere, right? You realize that there's, I don't need to impress anyone, right? Because I know where I'm centered, right? Now, that doesn't mean I don't like that stuff. Believe me, I'm going to get into my fancy Bibles here in a little bit, so I have my little things. Where I like to show up to where my fancy paper and pens and all that stuff. <clears throat> but once you're centered, you realize you don't need to keep up the rat race to realize who you are or to, to drive your worth from that. In verse 9, I think we can count five descriptions that will make a huge difference in our lives if we can be open enough to understand them. And it will impact, most importantly, how we express our faith to others, to the community, and to the world, really. So let's start. First, we need to understand this, that Jesus picked you out. Jesus picked me out, but you are a chosen race. Jesus picked you. And why did he pick you? Don't really know. He just did. As we'll see here in a moment, what we're going to read out of Ephesians 1, God picked us out by his own good pleasure because it makes him happy to do so. In theological circles, that's called the unconditional election of God. And he unconditionally elects his followers. Brothers and sisters, God chose you, not because of your race, your religion, not because of your upbringing or your morality or your education, or any other qualification. God chose you out of his own goodwill and pleasure. Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world to be holy, holy and blameless before him in love, to the praise of his glorious grace. Brothers and sisters, we need to rejoice at that every day. There was nothing that made you valid, more valuable than others. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't have to meet any specific condition to come to Jesus. And we should stand in awe of that fact. Out of all of the people headed to destruction, headed away from God towards eternal darkness, Jesus chose you to believe in him and to have eternal life. In spite of your total depravity, in spite of being born in sin, the irresistible grace of God chose you. So what should your response be to this? It should be twofold. First, you should repent of your sin. And secondly, you need to believe in the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ unconditionally. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. What an awesome fact to remember. And, and listen, I know, I know that sometimes this can get in our head because there are certain things in Scripture that are true that we need to accept through faith. 
Scripture teaches two things clearly throughout the entirety of the Bible. One, it teaches that God is sovereign, that he's in control of all things. Secondly, it teaches that each and every one of us is morally accountable for every single decision that we make. How do those two things live together? No one really knows. That's a mystery of the faith. But the scripture says they do. And we have that faith in God that it's true. So if someone here says, well, uh, God chose me for whatever so I can live however I want. No, 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 no. Scripture is clear. You're still accountable for your decisions. But God chose you for his good pleasure. And you are his. And once Jesus chooses you, that's it. You're his eternally. That brings us to point number two. Jesus lets you in. He chooses you and he lets you in. It says, but you are a royal priesthood. First, Jesus lets you into the kingdom. Our father in heaven is the king. That makes you his child. That means that spiritually you have royal blood flowing through your veins. You are his child. Jesus lets you into the kingdom and then he lets you be a priest. So does that mean that you're a priest? Yes, absolutely. It's what theologians call the priesthood of all believers. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that everyone here is going to put on a collar and start preaching? Not necessarily. But let's understand what this means a little bit. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, John wrote, And he made us to be a kingdom of priests, serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what does it mean that you're a priest? Here's what it means. It means that you, you individually, have immediate and direct access to God. You don't need another human, alive or dead, to act as a mediator. When, that, uh, when, when, when the curtain tore in the temple, when Jesus was crucified, that signified the end of the need of someone to go to God on your behalf. You have direct access to Jesus. You have direct access to God. You now have an active role in God's presence. So what does that mean? It means that you shouldn't waste your time. You shouldn't waste your time. Every aspect of your life is a priestly service. You are never out of the presence of God. You know what that means? You can't just say, hey God, I'm going to Vegas this weekend. I'm checking out on being a Christian. See you on Monday. It doesn't work like that. It means that like when Gramp went off on the pool installers, right? You know this story. When he got all upset and he looked at me and he said, Vince, you've got to forget that you're a pastor for about 15 minutes. You can't do that. Because we are that always. Always. You are always active in the kingdom. And as a result, you should always be doing kingdom service. So understand, brothers and sisters, that Jesus picked you out. Jesus let you in. Number three, Jesus set you apart. It goes on in verse nine. You are a holy nation. You're not just an average person in the world anymore. You have been set apart by God. You exist for God. And since God is holy, you need to be holy because you share in God's character. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says, You are a people, for you are a people holy to the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people, to be his treasured possession. Does anyone know what the word holy means? Anybody? Set apart. Set apart. The word holy means set apart or to draw near. That's why, in fact, here's a cool little trivia thing if you're ever on like, you know, who wants to be a millionaire or something. The reason why they started writing Holy Bible on the front of Bibles is because by reading it, you are being set apart. You are drawing near to God. That's why they wrote that on there. It's the Holy Bible, because through it, God sets us apart. Through it, we are being drawn near. So when you don't act in a holy way, you are acting out of character with who you are. 
When you live in an unholy way, you're contradicting the fundamental nature of who you are in God's sight. Why do you think it hurts so much when someone is hurt by someone else in the church? It hurts doubly. Because unfortunately, we should know better. We should know better. So it hurts worse. A good friend of mine last year, horrible thing, I had to go to his funeral because he took his own life. He took his own life. But his sister shared a very funny story. His sister was two years younger than him at school. I did not even know the story until the, until the funeral because I met him in high school and this happened in grade school, middle school. So one day she came home crying because a group of boys created an all boys club and said that the number one person that they were going to dislike was Lisa, this girl. They put her name on, this is the person we're going to dislike. So the mom said to her, well, did you talk to John or any of these guys, his friends? And she goes, that's the worst part, mom. John is the head of the club. <laughs> yeah. And she said what hurt so bad was that her brother was one of the ones that made her top of the list for the boy haters club, or her girl haters club back then. Why did that hurt her so bad? Because that was her brother. She wasn't expecting him to turn on her. That's why the sins within the church hurt so hard. Because we're all brothers and sisters in the faith. So when we turn on someone within the church, that really stings. It really stings. Brothers and sisters, you were picked out. You were set apart. Number four, Jesus shows you off. It says, but you are a people for his own possession. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that people love to show off certain things they own, right? Every, every so often, you know someone that has a certain car that only comes out when the weather's nice, right? Only comes out when the weather's nice. Or, or you walk into someone's man cave and you'll find a precious autograph, right? Or some piece of, of memorabilia that means a lot, you know? I think some places you go to, it looks like a museum to a certain university, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but we do, we like to do that. Listen, listen, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. I love to show off my fancy Bibles. I love to show off my fancy paper, my, the fancy pens that I write with. I talk about these things as if everyone cares about them, and most of them don't. That's the way God is with each and every one of his followers. He loves to show us off. That's what we're there for. Deuteronomy 14 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. It is you the Lord has chosen out of all the peoples on this earth to be his treasured possession. Now I know that God owns everything. So in a certain sense, everyone is God's possession. But this means something special for those who have faith in Jesus, who are part of the kingdom, because we are God's inheritance. We are the ones that he aims to spend eternity with. In Deuteronomy 26, it says, Today the Lord has obtained your agreement to be his treasured people as he promised you, so keep his commandments. What a special thing that is, right? What an absolutely special thing that is. I can't wait, believe it or not, I can't wait a little bit for Lori to come home. Not even so much for me, but for Patty, the little poodle. Do you know that since, that since Lori left two days ago, that dog, other than to go to the bathroom, has not left the top of the couch looking out the window. Has not left that spot. She's going to freak out when Lori shows up. Right? Why? Because that dog, he knows that Lori's everything for her. Right? And that's the way it is with us in the kingdom with God our Father. Do you know how much, I, I, I tell this to my students, sometimes I tell this to my kids. When we're doing God's work in the kingdom, the smile that it brings to the Lord, when we're doing 
what we're called to be doing, the smile that brings the Lord. Brothers and sisters, Jesus picked you out. Jesus let you in. Jesus set you apart. Jesus shows you off. And lastly, Jesus lights you up. At the end of verse 9, it says, He called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. I love the way Matthew and Paul write about this. Matthew in chapter 5, 14 writes, You are the light of the world. And Paul in Philippians chapter 2 writes, be blameless in this perverse generation and shine like stars in the universe. That one particularly hit me as I thought about it last night. So last night I get home and then our, on our street is pitch blackness, right? Pitch dark. All the lights are off except for Grandpa across the street who's got one of those nice wired in generators, right? The whole house, like nothing happened, right? I looked out last night around 11 o'clock and something hit me. Gramp has one little light post in his front yard, not nothing fancy. On a regular night, you don't even notice that it's there because everyone has this kind of light post in front of their house. But do you know that with the whole street pitch black, that little tiny light post gave off enough light that it kind of lit up all of the houses a little bit that were around it. And in a little way, brothers and sisters, that's what Paul is talking about each one of us being in the world, in this dark world. We're supposed to shine like stars in the universe, right? We're supposed to be a glimmer of light in the darkness. I found this great quote, brothers and sisters, and it's worth remembering. I don't know who said it, but it says, if you aren't enjoying these facts about who you are, it's not because they're beyond your reach, but it's because you're living beneath your privilege. And we need to understand that. If you aren't enjoying these facts about who you are, it's not because they're beyond your reach, but it's because you're living below your privilege. These things are true for every follower of Christ. So when you're feeling like you don't measure up, you have to remind yourself of these truths. Thinking about who you are to God will cut out the griping, or at least it should help reduce it. It will give you greater joy. It will give you greater contentment. You don't have to prove that you're worth something to anyone because you know how much you're worth to God. F forget LeBron James. Forget Baker Mayfield or Miles Garrett or anyone else. It's as if each one of you, each one of us, is a number one pick for God. Because Jesus loved you so much that you know who he gave himself for on the cross? For you. For you individually. For you individually. There wasn't anything like, hey Vince, I really like your grandpa, so you're alone for the ride. No. He loves me for me. And I place my faith in him. For him. For him. Understand, brothers and sisters, today is not a self-esteem talk. I don't want to come up here to tell you how great and wonderful everybody is. This is just understanding the word of God and the truth of the scripture. It's all about what Jesus did to make you who you are. It doesn't have to be all about you because the God of the universe is already all about you. And as you'll see, brothers and sisters, answering who you are, answering the question, who am I, leads directly to another question. And that question is, why am I here? Because your identity leads to your fulfillment of God's will in your life. Rick Warren, the author of The Purpose Driven Life, said this, you were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, you will never make sense. Your life will never make sense. You were made for God, not vice versa. That's one we really got to think about. You were made for God, not God was made for you. You were made for God, not vice versa. And life is about letting God use you for his purposes, not you using him for your own purposes. So why am I here? Well, verse 9 tells us that we're here to proclaim the mighty works of Christ. 
In the very end, it says that you're God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you. You know, we can't really talk about who we are without talking about who he is. The biblical understanding of human self-identity has got to be radically self-centered. One of the reasons that some of us aren't getting the kind of results that we want with our lives or our families or our friends is because they instinctively know that our sharing isn't all about God and it needs to be. That ends up putting way too much pressure on a person, way too much focus on self. When the reality is I don't have to be all of those things because the God of the universe already loves me more than I can ever possibly imagine. That way, the focus can be all about him. In Isaiah chapter 43, the prophet Isaiah wrote, the people whom I made for myself will make my name known and be praised. Think about that. That God loves you so much that you might proclaim how mighty he is because he chose you. That God loves you so much that you might proclaim how mighty he is because he made you royalty. That God loves you so much that you might proclaim how mighty he is because he made you a priest in the kingdom. That God loves you so much that you might proclaim how mighty he is in your holiness and being set apart. And that God loves you so much that you might proclaim how mighty he is because he brought you into a marvelous light. Brothers and sisters, our purpose is for the sake of making his identity known. Because the reality is that God made you who you are to show the world who he is. God made you who you are in order to show the world who he is. I go back to Paul in Ephesians. I love what he wrote in chapter 3 of Ephesians. In verse 8, Paul wrote, Though I did nothing to deserve it, and though I'm the least deserving Christian there is, I was chosen for the special joy of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ Jesus. How awesome is that? Brothers and sisters, we can proclaim his mighty works in our church services with teaching and singing and praying. And we can proclaim his mighty works in our youth classes, in our study groups, when we tell each other what God has done for us. We can proclaim his mighty works when we tell people that we know, our friends and our family, why we think he's so great. We proclaim how mighty he is when we're living the life that Jesus chose for us to live. I love that quote from Martin Luther. And this goes for everyone here who has a job. Martin Luther talking about what a, a Christian shoemaker. He said, a Christian shoemaker does not tell the world how much he loves the Lord by how big of a cross he places on each shoe. He tells the world how much he loves the Lord by making the best shoe that he could possibly make. Because when we are in Christ and we have our identity in him, everything that we do with our lives is a reflection of his greatness. Amen? Brothers and sisters, the time is now. And if you, had not, if you have not made these words of scripture the dominant reality in your life, then let today be the day. Then let today be the day. And quit struggling with who I got to impress or what I got to do or how I got to keep up. Because even Solomon said that going after those things is like trying to catch the wind. It will never happen. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we just humbly ask you, show us that way, Lord. Let us understand truly that you have chosen us, that you have set us apart, that we can rest in you, that we 
can, can find who we are and why we're here in you, that we can truly be a light in the darkness and shine for you. Jesus, if there's anyone here that's, that's struggling, if there's anyone here that's trying to keep up the show, if there's anyone here that's trying to, to white knuckle it through life, let today be the day where they let go of the grip that they're hanging on to and simply place their faith in you. Lord, we will never be at peace. We will never be satisfied. We will never understand who we are or why we're here until we fully place our faith in you. Lord, let today be the day. We love you and we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.